So today we're going to be talking about a biodiesel quality comparison for different feedstock oils. So picture this, a world where vehicles roar from the power of nature, where exhaust fumes smell like french fries, and every mile driven is a step towards a greener tomorrow. Welcome to the era of biodiesels, where innovation meets sustainability to revolutionize transportation as we know it. Biodiesel is a fuel that is made from discarded vegetable oils, renewable plant oils, animal fats, and most recently algae. It is comprised of long chain fatty acids, also known as esters, and biodiesel can also be referred to as fame or fatty acid methyl esters, which is the standard chemical term for biodiesel derived from renewable sources. So why biodiesel? It has many advantages, starting with it's renewable and sustainable. Unlike fossil fuels, biodiesel's feedstocks can be replenished using natural processes like farming, so we can continuously keep growing the feedstocks needed to produce the, the fuel. Unlike fossil fuels, where once we've used a resource, it is, can take many years to replenish. Secondly, it contains fewer emissions. It redu reduces carbon dioxide, NOx, particulate matter, and hydrocarbons, all while reducing greenhouse gas emissions. And lastly, it is less hazardous and toxic. It's safer to store and transport than diesel fuel while having a higher flash point, making it less combustible. Um, our objective of our project is to determine and compare the fame or the fatty acid composition of biodiesels made from different feedstock oils to see which oil is going to give your biodiesel the highest quality. We took three oils, sunflower, soybean, and canola, and transformed them into D100 biodiesel samples, and then analyzed the fame composition by gas chromatography. So our reason for interest. Like I stated, biodiesel is a renewable and sustainable fuel. Before it can be used as a fuel, it has to be evaluated both quantitatively and qualitatively to ensure that it can be blended with diesel. ASDM D6751 and EN14214 outline specific limits that bio D100 biodiesels must meet before they, or no matter what the feedstock is. For our, sorry, by our examining the composition, we're starting with our feedstocks you want to your fuel to be maximized for properties. By examining the ch chemical composition of our feedstocks, the, the chemical composition results in the composition of the resulting biodiesel. Therefore, by looking at the composition of the biodiesel, we can see which oil is going to potentially be the most superior. So there are two phases, phases within this project, first one being the biodiesel production. And this is based on a transesterification reaction. Ideally, we were going to use a biodiesel trainer to produce our samples. Due to the sample size it was going to create, we modified our procedure for a smaller lab scale. So phase one started with titrations. And this included blank titrations to ensure our, our alcohol was fresh and catalyst titrations to ensure that we were using the right amount of catalyst. These were both done in triplicate once we had determined how much catalyst, it was time for the reaction. We took our potassium hydroxide amount, added it with methanol to create a methoxide. That was then combined with our oil to create our biodiesels. Our biodiesels were then left to separate for a week. A transesterification reaction yields the products of biodiesel and glycerin, and it's important that these two are separated from one another because glycerin contains salts, free fatty acids, and other contaminants that you don't want in your fuel. Once they were separated, we took the pH and the physical properties to ensure that our sample quality was appropriate. So here are our finished biodiesels. As you can see, we did the canola in triplicate. Ideally, they would all be done in triplicate, but just due to time, that wasn't possible. So our samples have a nice top layer of crude biodiesel with the bottom layer being the glycerin. Finished biodiesel should have an appearance of clear, bright and light yellow to golden color depending on the feedstock which as you can see the canola is much more of a golden color than the sunflower. Then once they were separated we took the pH of our samples. Finished pH of a biodiesel should be around 7 when comparing our uh, pH strips to the colored pH scale. They all met the criteria and they met the physical properties criteria which meant we can move on to the second phase which was gas chromatography. This is used to separate chemicals in a mixture and has been shown to be an effective method to resolve and quantify polar fames. 
Originally, we wanted to use an internal standard of methyl heptadecanoate, which is a C17 carbon, to be able to calculate the ester and the linolenic acid methyl ester content in a weight percentage. Due to inventory issues, we could not add the internal standard into all of our samples, therefore we can't use it. So we just ran our samples diluted in heptane on the DC and are now focusing on the fatty acid groups in a percent composition, focusing on the saturated, monounsaturated, and polyunsaturated fatty acids. But this change is still allowing us to reach our same end goal of which oil is superior. So start off looking at our results. You'll see in each chromatogram that the carbon chains, they loop from smallest to largest. The canola oil was found to be dominated by the C181 fatty acid, which is the oleic, and the C182, the linoleic. Interesting fact about the canola oil that we found, you'll see there's a little peak here at 5.358 minutes. Theoretically, when compared to research, that peak does not exist. There should not be a peak in between C182 and C183 since they elute in order, so we just left it as an unknown. When looking at our soybean oil, it is only comprised of two carbon chains, the C18 or C18 and the C16, with the carbon constituents, dominated by the C18-2, with also um, high per second the C16 and the C18-1. Our last oil was the sunflower oil. Again, dominated by the C18-2, but you'll see that it has much less or fewer amount of fatty acids in its composition. It only contained four, while the canola oil had eight, and the soybean had five. Theoretically, there would be longer chain fatty acids in a very small percentage, around the 6.5 to 8.5 mark, but our detector just wasn't sensitive enough to detect that. So, from our results, I compiled all of the data from each canola oil, or from each biodiesel from each oil in run and triplicate of each fatty acid found with their percent composition. Now, I know this is a lot of numbers, so I want to focus on the bottom three rows, the total saturated, total monounsaturated, and total polyunsaturated. So, what do you want in your fuel? The tricky part about the thane composition is that a characteristic that enhances the fuel stability often causes poor performance at a low temperature, meaning one fatty acid that improves the physical quality often degrades another one. And because there's no specific limit or percentage that you need to meet for each fatty acid group within your fuel, there's a general guideline, or I put it into a formula, of that what you want and that satisfies all the requirements. So let's start with the first component. You want a high percentage of saturated fatty acids. Second component is a low percentage of saturated fatty acids. And these two paired together enhance your cold flow properties. And your cold flow properties are related to the ability of the gelling ability in your fuel in cold temperatures, which is not ideal when living in an environment where we have cold winters. You don't want your biodiesel to be gelling in your engine. The third component, the last component, is the low percentage of polyunsaturated fatty acids. A high percentage of these creates less oxidation stability in your fuel and can impair the fuel quality by the creation of unwanted species from the multiple double bonds. So you want a low percentage to achieve better oxidation stability. And these two characteristics are not the most important, but they are very important because they're the characteristics that vary the most with the change in the feedstock. So, when we add all of our components up, we yield a high quality biodiesel. So let's dive into our results. Starting with the saturated fatty acids, these are the carbon chains that contain no double bonds. So this consists of the C16, C18, C20, and C22. From our data table earlier that I showed you, the canola oil had the lowest with an average of 5.39%. The soybean had the highest with 16.11%. The sunflower was in the middle of the two with 10.25. Our standard deviation bars are fairly small. Although sunflower does show some variation, it is still very small in the grand scheme of things. So we can conclude 
that the canola oil has a low saturated percentage. Moving on to the monounsaturated fatty acids, these are the carbon chains that contain one double bond, so the C16, C18, and the C21. From our results, obviously the canola oil dominated with 68.67% of monounsaturated fatty acids, with soybean and sunflower being low, half, half of this value, lower than half, with soybean having the lowest of 22.14 and sunflower having 34.63. Because obviously biodiesel has the highest, it is the more favorable. The last group of fatty acids we looked at was the polyunsaturated, and these are the carbon chains that have more than one double bond, so the C18-2 and the C18-3. Obviously, you can see from our bars that the canola oil had the lowest with 25.54%, and soybean having the highest with 61.75, and sunflower also a high percentage of 55.13. Over 50% of their composition is made up of these polyunsaturated fatty acids, indicating that the canola is the best out of this group. So, when we go back to our formula, of the high monounsaturated from their graphs, we can see that the canola oil was the winner for that. The oil that had the lowest saturated percentage, again, the canola oil. And finally, our last component, the low or low percentage of polyunsaturated fatty acids, can you guess canola oil? Therefore, when you add all of our components up, we are left with canola oil theoretically being the oil that's going to produce the highest quality biodiesel. Now, to ensure that our results are accurate and precise, we had to apply some statistical analysis. I ran a one-way ANOVA at a 95% confidence level for each group of fatty acids found in all of the oils. So from our F values for all three groups, you can see that they are very high. They are around the, oh, they're in the thousands, and 45,000. So compared to our F value of 5 point, or F critical of 5.14, obviously all of our F values are higher than that, indicates that we reject the non-hypothesis and accept the alternative that there is in fact a difference between the meats. This is also confirmed by our P values being lower than our alpha value of 0.05. To sum everything up, based on our formula, the high monounsaturated with a low saturated and polyunsaturated percentage paired with our statistical analysis of with our F values being higher than our F critical and our P values being lower than our alpha, we can conclude at a 95% level of confidence that the canola oil is the best oil for biodiesel production. There's no project without challenges. The first challenge we encountered during this project was during the titration. We are finding that our oil was separating from our alcohol and our nice pink solution from our phenolphthalein indicator was now reverting back to the white hazy state as it was before we completed the titrations. To resolve this issue, I warmed up the oils prior to titrations and that seemed to fix the problem. The second problem we had was during phase two in the GC analysis, we found that our soybean and our sunflower samples were too saturated, therefore our peaks were not separating well and they just looked like one big peak. <laughs> so to fix that, I reprepped the samples with a 10 to 1 dilution of heptane and biodiesel and as seen in our chromatograms earlier in the presentation, our peaks separated nicely. Some immediate next steps I would take within this project, obviously to start with triplicates. We were able to complete the titrations and the GC runs in triplicate but not creating our values of samples, um, specifically the soybean and the sunflower in triplicate. This would increase our statistical confidence with our results. A second step would be to obviously continue what we originally were starting and to include the internal standard into our samples to be able to calculate the ester and the linolenic acid methyl ester content to be able to compare our results with the set limits by ASDM and EN. To make peak identification easier, I would run a known fame standard on our conditions. Because we did not do that, comparing a weight percentage to a percent composition, 
obviously not going to line up 100%, um, and we didn't have the exact retention times for the peaks, so running a known fame standard would give you the known uh, times and make, make it much easier to match. Fourth step, I would use an FID detector to pick up those smaller percentages of fatty acids for the longer chain and the shorter chain, like the C14, that we could not detect due to our PCD detector. And lastly, I would complete more of the quality tests outlined by the ASTM and EN standards. Because we know the fame composition, it would be beneficial to see the relationship between that and multiple parameters like the septane number, viscosity, iodine value, all of those, and you'd be able to compare your results with numerical values, which we could not do because there was no set limits that we needed in our fuel. So we know that the amount of each class of fatty acid found in your feedstock is an essential indicator of the fuel's quality, and to produce a high quality biodiesel depends on the feedstock. Since we determined that canola is the oil of choice for biodiesel production, it would be worth looking into how the or different factors of the canola oil, such as growing conditions or different strains of canola oil, like GMO versus non-GMO, to see if you could potentially find percentages, maximum percentages for each fatty acid class to be able to maximize your properties. And this is important because biodiesel is an emerging fuel substitute that can reduce our reliance on fossil fuels. So from that, through the combination of innovation and sustainability, we have the potential to revolutionize the transportation sector, leading us to an era of eco-friendly and efficient fuel solutions. Thank you. Okay. Any questions? I have a question. Yes. If there was a group who yep. was going to continue on mm -hmm. with this topic, yep. I'll say, what would be your advice to them? I would probably pick, if I were to pick a group to continue this as well, it would be the free fatty acid groups mm -hmm. because it's very closely related to what we're talking about. But I would definitely do your research. Um, and there's like so many things that you can do to add on to this. Like this is just covering like a small percentage of the world of biodiesels. And even some advice I would say is look into not different oils, but seeing if you could make a mixture of like canola oil with another oil to see if you could also maximize properties like that. But yeah, that's what I can think of for <laughs> advice right now. Great. <laughs>